now, Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. In fact, a very special edition. We have got Frankie Sullivan from Survivor, and I don't think he's actually done an interview in the last uh, 20 years or so. So it's just an absolute pleasure to have him on, and of course, joined as always by the seul et unique, the one and only, Alan Niven. Bonjour, Monsieur Alain. How are you? I'm very good, and I have to say that's a feather in your cap. When you can persuade somebody who is interview phobic and has been for 20 years to sit and talk with you, that's uh, that's cool. Because I'm I'm very gentle. That's why I'm a gentle, gentle person. <laughs> but uh, that said, they they had or Frankie had this enormous success with Eye of the Tiger. It just it was everywhere. It's iconic at this point. What are sort of your perceptions of that song? Is it possible to have a song that is just so popular that it actually, in the long run, ends up hurting the band? Oh, there are, there are countless examples of that where um, something becomes a much bigger hit than anybody anticipated because it develops a life of its own and connects to an audience profoundly. And the audience connects to it and it's beyond marketing it's beyond moving it up playlists it just happens because it becomes a song of the moment and i've lived through that experience a couple of times and there's nothing you can do about it ex- except accept it and be really happy that you actually do connect to people but i as a tiger i mean wasn't that in almost every Rocky movie, for example. Well, it was certainly in um, one of the Rocky movies. It, 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 it's, it's, it's tied in, you know, when you hear that song, you cannot not picture Sylvester Stallone in your head. You know, it automatically exactly. he, he comes to your mind. Well, but let me ask you about your songwriting. Was there a song that you wrote that you just thought, oh, okay, it's a song, and then next thing you know, it's a big success for Great White or for Guns N' Roses or for, for whoever you were working with at the time, Berlin? Uh, yeah, there were, you know, there were a couple of songs that did quite well. And um, you, you're almost scared to invest the hope that it is going to do well because you, you kind of get this superstitious and think you're going to jinx it. But I mean, you know, I knew Rock Me was a special track. Um, and I was really thrilled at how well that connected. And it was a little bit of a surprise. We got wonderful reaction to that. Well, Rock Me is a, is a great track. And uh, Jack Russell does a version of it acoustically on this new acoustic album that he put out. And it absolutely works. I mean, it's, it's, it's this big sort of rocker from the 80s. And then you think, well, it's not going to work stripped down. And this new version that Jack does uh, is just fantastic. I mean, absolutely fantastic. Anyway. Well, the interesting thing about acoustic versions is this, is I'm a great proponent of something I call the rug jam. And when you think you have a song and you think you've got it formed, the final stage of it is to actually sit on the rug with somebody and a pair of you play it together with acoustically and then you find out if you've got a song or not uh, and any moments that aren't working are immediately apparent so in some ways almost everything i've ever written has had an acoustic base to it at some point yeah well uh, on that uh this interview is about an hour and eight minutes so i i'd i'm not going to add 20 minutes of of intro to it so what do you say we just get over to uh, to frankie sullivan we'll get him we'll hear all these great stories about eye of the tiger and and the rocky movies and the band and just all kinds of great stuff and uh there is one silver lining to the covid19 uh pandemic he actually has sat down through all these hard drives of music that he's had for the last 20 years which he's never touched before and said Hey, you know what? Let's see if there's some some songs here that we can we can put out. So it has uh, prompted him to uh, revisit old uh, old songs, and and we're gonna have some new music coming soon from him. So there you go. That's a great benefit. There you go. Let's go and hear about him. Here is uh, the one, uh, the only Frankie Sullivan. We are speaking with uh, the one and only Frankie Sullivan of a Survivor. And folks, I got to tell you, this is an incredible honor because, uh, as Frankie himself says, he doesn't do a lot of interviews. So thank you for agreeing to do one with me. Merci, as we say. 
Oh, that's my pleasure, Rich. I, I, I actually, I, I did quite a few of them and I rather enjoyed them. I just decided the last 20 years that I would just kind of lay low for a while, you know? So I, you're kind of the, Hey, I not, I don't stick my foot in the pool. I just dive in the deep end. So we're off and running. We're off and running, but, but well, I'm, thank- glad, I'm glad to be on mic again. That's nice. Well, thank you for doing this, though, because oh, the, the, you know, I, I think there's a great story to be told, and we'll we'll try to get as much done. And you know, like I said before, we'll we'll try to keep it to half an hour. Though we could probably stretch it to two hours. Um, let's start with the current stuff. You you have tweeted out and teased a little bit about a project uh, that you are working on. Tell me about that. Uh, what is this project? Okay, but okay, but first you have to know, you know, the Twitter thing. I I have a company that does that stuff, but you know, I do my own stuff. I'm I I got the guitar players have this thing about Instagram. I don't know what it is, but guitar players. Oh, I have a lot of fans that follow me, but guitar players follow other guitar players. So, and they set it up so whenever I post on Instagram, I think it goes out as a tweet, but. You know, I got. I want to get more. Eventually, I think it will build up, but I haven't built up a Twitter following yet because I've spent most of my time on Instagram. Um, but isn't it all the same, really, when it comes down to it? Sort of, though. They each sort of hit their own different markets. But I got to say, when I woke up and I saw Frankie Sullivan is following you, I went, "Oh, look at that! That is very exciting." <laughs> I don't. And you know what? Somebody I have to I have to remember, and I will tell you. Hopefully, there's a question. Somebody that we both know said you need to follow me. I and it's a guitar player friend of mine. I have to remember who because I think you probably know most of them. So you probably interviewed most of them. But right. I'll try to remember before the interview. But go ahead. But yeah, yeah. I've been tweeting. Yeah. So so talk to me about this project. Now you told me that before the interview that your voice is a little hoarse because you've been writing these demos and you've been singing all night and you're going to do this project where you're the lead vocalist. So what is this? When does it come out? What what are we doing musically? Is it? You know, um, well, I have two things, and one of them, and I always, you know, we go back. So I always. I never liked interviews where somebody said, "Oh, I have a secret project going on," and I don't. But one I have going on that's just going to be great, and it's a, not secret; it's a surprise one. Um, the other one is me. You know, the other one I'm working on my own. I've never during during the '80s. Um, there were many times because I did a lot of work behind the scenes with the band with, with survivor back then i was active with ron and, and and the producers and engineers and putting songs together and sequencing records and i did a lot of stuff behind the scenes and there was there were a few times when the people at epic would say make a record and i would always say i'm in such a great band i, I got you know especially you know jameson's era you know talk about a voice you know, who else is going to sing, you know, deliver these songs better? So I just concentrated because, you know, it was intense because I, I love to write songs and songwriting was so much a part of that band, you know, um, about half, not as much as people think because we were also a great live rock and roll band, but it was so important. And by the time I got done writing and recording a record, I had to take a little bit of time off. Then we would go on the road, so I never really had time. But there was a couple of times where um, Lenny Peaches, the guys that were running up would, would say, why don't you do your own project? And I would think of myself, I don't have any time. I, I don't, I'm a committed guy. What are the other guys going to think? You know how bands get, especially back then. I don't want any bad vibes. And I was always kind of, kind of tired because there was a lot of extracurricular work. Although I loved it, but the behind the scenes stuff, um, I'll put it to you this way. I worked with the most amazing producers and ended up co-producing with one of them who worked with Zeppelin and the first bad company record and did Quadrophenia and spent time with Pete Townsend uh, on a, in a golf wing uh, studio recording sounds for Tommy. And I was so lucky to end up co-producing the record. It's Ron Nevison. He's one of the best producers ever in history. So, that stuff to me was always such a great learning curve. I really never had time to do much of my roots. You know, I come from a different era. You know, I come, my background, you know, with the band, I, I came from a totally different background. 
So I never really did anything on my own, but I would go work with like the girls at heart or Eddie money. Eddie would have me do something sometimes John wait, but you know, I really stuck with the band. So I never really did anything on my own. And then around 89 or so after the two out to sleep record, you know, Jim and I kept writing and writing because you know, we, I loved this. We just wrote, 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 wrote. We wrote five days a week, actually. And usually from two to seven, so we could miss traffic. Um, so I was kind of, it was always intense for me. You know what I'm saying? There was a lot of, there's a lot of high energy intensity that you put into what you do and songwriting. And then if you're involved with, you know, some, arranging the songs and then you get involved with the producing and the sounds and mastering the record, that's, that's producers have hard jobs. I found that out right away. I said, I don't know if there's any glory in this. Although I, I was always honored to work with people like Ron or Frank Filippetti. You know, these are iconic people, but I always felt like those people really know how hard they work. So I was more paying attention to A, the band, our songs. And I felt it was around 83 or four to around 88, nine, 88 or nine. I was just all in. So I didn't think of anything else. No, so we fast forward, here we are like, what, 50 years later? <laughs> like 20 years later, and I just, I never stopped playing. I should so shoot you a picture. I'm sitting in my master, but you know, to get over to this chase lounge, you gotta jump over about 50 guitar keys. <laughs> They're just strewn all over the room because I still play a lot. And um, I play a lot of, uh, acoustic guitars you know i collect guitars but because i only if they're great and strong great i'm not a hoarder but there's something about an acoustic guitar and being organic so as i would sit here at night i i started recording it and they filled up hard drives over the years so when this started out with this covid virus i said i'm going to start going through this stuff i found some stuff that i don't know if i was surprised i was more happy to find it and then start developing it so i started thinking about you know, the band's great and we do our thing, but maybe it's time I do something on my own. Now, I have two ways of looking at that, but that's kind of how it evolved. My background, you know, is pretty deep. I, was, I wasn't just a guitar player. I love guitar. If I had to pick up anything, I would only be a guitar player. Um, but I also was intrigued with the studios and and the record producers and the engineers, you know, I became great friends with them all because A, I couldn't believe how hard they worked, really couldn't. And really to make our songs sound as good as they could and B, how incredibly talented the record producers were. But at the end of the day, you know, Ron Emerson once said to me, all this stuff, none of it matters because it's all about the song. And this old famous line, he used to say, you know, you can't polish a turd. And I always, I was young when he said it to me, and I said, that's kind of a weird way of putting it, because we're throwing up bombs around by then. And I knew what he meant right away. If it doesn't have it, and you don't feel it, and it doesn't have the ring in the room, don't play it for me. Because <laughs> whenever I'd play on something he didn't like, that's what he would say. You can't polish that one. Okay, so I would move on. So I think over these years of being quiet and introspective and um, which we can get into some of that in a minute too. I think I developed a yeah. certain sense of what's best for, for me away from, you know, writing the songs that I love, love, I love them. I love to write songs. They're like, they're like our creations. I think it's awesome to do that. And I love to have, a, 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 I loved all of them. Um, but I loved the, the, the Jameson era with the, with, every bit of my being because he was an amazing singer um he was unbelievably good looking he was a, he was a the girls love him but beyond that not selfishly he was an absolute songwriter's dream because he was not only a fantastic singer unbelievable thick voice could hit all the notes you could understand every word that he sang which i took notice to the first time we auditioned him you know that's rare a lot of times you listen to a record, go, what did he say? What did he say? There are singers, you listen and you can hear every word. You know, that's kind of a pronunciation thing. So I was kind of really endeared to that era. And just stayed into it until, you know, now it's been over for a while. And I've been thinking about what am I going to do with all these ideas? Because you never stop. 
You know, you never stop playing. I think guitar players, maybe that's our saving grace. You know, I mean, I here, my eye was Jeff Beck. You know, he came back out playing, what, about 10 years ago? He was even going to tour this year again. So I think guitar players never stop playing. And hopefully on there, I think you get good enough to where it becomes part of your daily ritual. And if you're playing a guitar, I know if I am, there's always an idea, a riff that comes up. And before I know it, I got either a cell phone, which is a, something I really don't like. But I got something. Rec- I still like the recording in my hand, how to set recorder. But I end up recording stuff. And before I know it, it's five or six hours have gone by. So that's kind of like returning to, I guess, to my heart and soul, you know, where it really is. Because I think at the same time, aren't we all kind of doing a balancing act, you know, life, peace? You know what I mean? Free spirited, but yet guarded enough so we we don't get hurt. You know, it seems like I do this juggling act, but I think maybe that's part of life. It's certainly part of my life. And guitar players know this. It comes out in our playing because it all has to do with how you touch the string and the neck. And I think that's part of that organic thing I talked about earlier. So I. All my friends who are really good guitar players, some very well known, I don't you drop names, you know, been encouraging me. And some young artists, I won't mention names, who I just love, I think they're amazing. They've sent me some messages and text messages, and I'm like, this guy would be really cool to sing, you know, blah, blah, blah song. You know what I'm saying? So, I started thinking really creatively and I came up with two really, really, really good ideas for projects. One's going to be dedicated to someone else in another band, but one I want to do my own. So that's kind of where I'm at and that's where we can start. Yeah, so so this project, it's going to be the Frankie Sullivan solo project, I would imagine. And are these songs that you've gone through all, all these hard drives, are they leftover demos from, from Survivor? Were they songs that you were writing for the girls in heart? What are sort of the genesis of these songs? And is this going to be like an acoustic record or is this like a band record? You know, you're, it's funny because you're hitting all the bells on all the cymbals at the same time. So I have to, <laughs> you have to ask me one of those questions at a time because that struck about five questions. In me. I, you know, if I, I would never do a project and call it like the blah, 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 my name, a solo project, the Frankie Sullivan. I would always have a band type project because I like the input. I like to surround myself and I would do it. And I know some great ones with some great players I like the fact that we all set up, you know, that's the thing we didn't do enough of back, you know, back in the eighties, that was a bit that I don't know that bands did enough of that, but I would, I would always prefer to set up as a band and play in a room with great players. And, uh, you know, we kind of all mesh and we know what we're doing. Yeah. It's going to be centered around what I do and I'll write the songs, but I want players to have equal input as far as their parts and good players just naturally fall into that you know what i'm saying that chemistry kind of creates itself you can't write script this out it doesn't work it's just after these the amount of years that's passed i've run into okay this guy's amazing he plays b3 he plays roads you know so i have a list now of like the guys i would do with and i i talked to him on i've worked with worked with him on it and one of them has came up with a great idea i i may even have another guitar player or maybe two i don't really know yet but I want it to be organic. I want it to be more about my roots. So I think it's more in between. I do a lot of acoustic music, but then I like rhythms and beats, but I love guitars. So there would be a lot of guitars. So you would have acoustics, but you have electrics, you'd have, you'd have telecasters, you would have stratocasters, you'd have Les Pauls, you'd have different amps. You know, I like different textures. So, you know, one of the guys I like a really lot, I could use as a great example, Mike Campbell. Instead of doing a Mike Cam- the Mike Campbell record, just put another band together. I forget what they're called. It's kind of a great name. But um, I think if you get the right guys in the room, I think things just happen. So, and then, you know, you can be, look at, you know, I always have to make these statements. Don't ask me why. I'm not Eric Clapton. But if you take a look at the bands he puts together, they all have a huge amount of input 
into what they do with his songs and how they're presented live. You know, you got Steve Gadd or, and Willie Weeks uh, or Nathan East on bass. You know, you're talking, and then he had Billy Preston for other, and then Paul Correct. These are really talented guys. So I think that Eric never just put, okay, you're just going to be in my band. I think he wanted to be surrounded by some people that, yeah, they're all great players, but these guys have real input. They participate like in the songs and parts, you know, like the way Paul Crack sings, you know, they, they're, they're participators rather than spectators. I think sometimes on solo records, there's, there can be a, a preconception by the people that come in and play with you and maybe a misconception by a listener. And I think if you can create that atmosphere, certainly for me, it works a lot better. And I think you get a lot more out of the other players. And I think it leads to what matters most to me, performance. Because when you can write a song and assemble the, the musicians that you kind of vibe with and you got a soul with, and you can capture a performance, you know, not force it. Like, you know, let's try a few takes of it, and, you know, three or four and see what we got and maybe get lucky and you capture that right performance. That's the chemistry that I really thrive in. So... When do you see this album coming out? Is this something that you're trying to get out for 2020? Or do you see it? No, I'm it? just working on it for 2020. Okay. You know, I don't really look at it. You know, it's funny, Mitch. I don't, I don't know. It's funny. I don't look at things and say, well, when do you want to get it out in these states? I don't. I, I guess in the 80s, you kind of had to because, you know, we were on a pretty grind. We all, all bands were, but it was a pretty grinding schedule. You make a record, you, you have a month off and you go on the road for a year and a half. Take three months off write the songs, make a record, take a month off, go on the road for you. You know, you do that from the eighties. And I think as I age, I realized that, um, being a new real musician and not coming from a place of ego, but really loving the aspect of what you do, the craft of what you've learned, putting together your knowledge, but then still reaching out and keeping friendships because there's a bond there. And, Getting the opinions of your mentors, you know, that to me is all part of what makes, that greases my wheels. That's what keeps me rolling. Yeah, it really does. Um, let me ask you just, let me get let me get Eye of the Tiger out of the way, because everybody talks about that song. But, I, but let me contextualize it I, this way. <laughs> I did a really good interview with The Guardian because they wanted to know, what's the real story? And I said, I'll tell you what I said, but if you want, you you can go ahead. Well, I, I, I want to ask you it this way, because years ago, I had this conversation with Doug Feger of The Knack, and I said, Doug, it's incredible. You wrote my Sharona. Everybody knows it. It's, it's a classic, and way to go, Doug. And he looked at me, and he said, he said, you don't understand. That was a golden albatross around me. And I go, what do you mean a golden albatross? It's my Sharona. It's the greatest song ever. He goes, no. He goes, yes, it bought me this house and it bought me the pool and the cars and it's given me all kinds of opportunities, but it essentially killed my career because every time I'd go to the record company with a new song, they'd say, that's nice, Doug, but we don't hear another My Sharona, so go try again. And so that's how I'm going to ask you this question. Was that song so big, so iconic, you know, it's in a, it's in a movie, it's in... It's, you know, it's in a Starbucks it's commercial. Part of, you know, it's part of here. It's part, I call it the Rocky franchise. In fact, I have a contract with that. It's, right. it's part of the Rocky franchise. It's huge. The, the Rocky franchise. You know, anything Sly does, he says, you know, him. He, he's just incredible. So it's huge. It's huge in a sense, but keep going. So the, the question is, 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 was the song so huge that at some point it had a, a, an effect on the band where you would come with a new album and a new song and the record company would just look at you and say, that's really nice, Frankie, but we don't hear Eye of the Tiger too." You know what? I, I have to tell you, this is how blessed God, bless me, God, Mitch, not once. I can't tell you that. I, I don't even, I can't even remember a hint of that ever because that moment, that whole Eye of the Tiger, I call it moment, which, by the way, that all that stuff you read about it is bullshit. The whole thing is hyped up bullshit. That moment, the Eye of the Tiger moment, is so special that it even takes it out of the realm of what Doug struggled with. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know what I mean by that? 
Yeah. With, with my Sharona. So being in that moment and Rocky and Rocky free and sly and, and the whole thing that was going on and it kind of took it to its own place. Was it huge? Yeah, it was huge, but it, it has such a, to this day, I always say it's got more legs than a caterpillar, but it had such an amazing effect on people. You know, that kind of, I, nobody sees that coming. I would get letters from Ray Retton and I would get into fights. I got to see Sugar Ray Leonard and, and uh, Tommy Hearns fight three twice. I got to see all kinds of, you know, it was a great calling card because it affected a lot of athletes, boxers that were training, um, a lot of people. And I think that's what took it away from just, okay, it's, it's one of those songs. I shouldn't say one of those songs. A song like where you talk about what Doug Figer went through. I think being part of the Rocky franchise kept us enough away from that to where we were able to move on. And I, our record label never once said that to us. So I think that was kind of special, too. Well, yeah, I, you're actually kind of blessed that they didn't they didn't sort of hit you with that. Oh, come on, write another one for us. So that that's actually kind of lucky. And and I'll, I'll get off of Eye of the Tiger in a second, but uh, a lot you of fans... too. I love that song. Oh, so do I. I, I love it. Uh, I love it to death. But I think, uh, you know, the diehard fans might know, but a lot of casual fans don't necessarily realize that what they're hearing in the movie is not the same song that, that's on the album. One is sort of more of a demo, and, and the other one is uh, a more produced version uh, just sort of talk to me if that, first of all, is that true? And and talk to me about how that happened where it's not the same song or the same version of the song. It is true. Well, you know, Mitch, it's pretty simple. It's the demo. And I was always partial to the demo because I'll tell you why. It's raw. It's rough. It's, you know, it's in your face. And I always had this concept, okay, demos, the guys aren't going to take it too seriously. Mark played his butt off on both tracks. You know, they all delivered, but the demo was kind of like, oh, it's just, you know, guys in bands, oh, this is just a demo. As soon as you saw just a demo on them, they do something better. So not that the demo was better, but here, we weren't, Sly was ready. Okay, I mean, what's wrong with this track? What's the demo? You know, what the heck, what the fuck does that mean? You know, Sly's like, what do you mean the demo? I want the song. You know, that's kind of the relationship. And I was like, okay, well, there's no problem. Fine, we'll use it. Yeah, it's 400, it's four minutes and 58 seconds. And it's the demo, but it kicks butt enough to where Stallone, you know, Sly's like, I, I, when I said, you know, the guys and the demo, he's like, what the hell are you talking about? Because he's a really wise, smart guy. And, you know, I'm like, you know what? I already knew in my head, I know what he's talking about. Just use it. So we didn't have the studio version done yet, which I never understood what a studio version means. I heard that called in an interview. I said, was that we didn't have the version that we put on the record, our record title that done. And that demo kicked butt. And by the time we put it to the film, which is a whole story in itself, it's an amazing story. I, I have such great memories of that. Um, the rawness of it made it work even better. Within the context of watching the movie, the, the rawness, the kick drum and the bass drum. And, you know, I, I was doing mixing back then. So where you would have those in the mix, there was louder. You know, Slow always wanted that, boom, I want to hear that kick. I knew what he wanted. He wanted four on the floor slamming and, and bass. So you, you get a, there was a lot of punch in that track. So I think in the context of, is it the demo? Well, it's a different version because it was what we cut to send to him to see if he liked the song. That's what it was. And that's exactly what he liked. And that's exactly what the man wanted in his movie. And that's what he got. And well, it was so it's true. It, it, oh, yeah. It you know, worked. He's a good guy. Oh, yeah. oh no, no. It's, I think it's killer. It worked. You know, he put me in a hot seat a few times. So. I, I like Raw. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about oh, the... Oh, it's uh, Raw. It's uh, raw. I want to ask you about the, the, the second, third, and fourth album. So Premonition, Eye of the Tiger, Caught in the Game. They were produced by you. Um, talk to me about the decision to produce your own albums, and is there sometimes a danger that you don't have a set of outside ears to say, hey, I hear this and I hear that? Is there a danger that well, sometimes... You know, yeah, go ahead. Mitch, that's, that's kind of a two-pronged question, and I like it. Um, 
if if I had, I always say this, don't, if, if I had anything to do over again, I'm going to do it the same way because, you know, if any of us could get a ticket back in the time, we're all, if the line's going to be pretty long. That being said, you know, we really didn't have much of a choice because of the budget at the time. And I had learned a lot and was still learning. I always believed and always had believed. And that's why I got along so well with our record producers. I don't even think I argue with, with Ron or Frank really pretty. Uh, maybe once. Um, that having not only an ear around, but having a person like Ron Nevison or Frank Filippetti in the room with you, hands down, takes the cake. Hands down. That's the winning deck right there. So is it better? I think it's absolutely better. And here's the danger. It's not the ears. When you do it yourself, you have to deal with your other band members. Well, other band members will take your direction better when you're working with a Ron or a Phil of Faith. But when you're working on your own, it causes some friction. So as I, you know, looking back on it with some perspective, I think that self-producing your own band it works and you can do a great job, but I think that it, I know that it causes tension within any band. It's just too hard not to, you know, because suddenly you're directing and, you know, maybe somebody had a fight with their wife or maybe it's some dogs, the dog bit the guy, you know, they, you're the good, they don't want to hear it. you're a band member. So, you know, it's a fine line because you're not that separate entity that can say, why don't you go fuck yourself? I don't know if you have to edit that out, but that I don't. producers are hard. Producers are hard. And Ron was not difficult. Ron was better than difficult. He was demanding. Same with Frank Filippetti. They were difficult. They were demanding. Well, you know, it's a different explanation of difficult, but it's just as heavy. So it takes a lot of the pressure off the, the, the self-produced, the, the guitar player and co-writer of the band and producing it and working with the engineers that creates tension within the band just by proxy. And I think maybe also that other guys have a bit of an attitude that you're doing it. That I think is, that may be natural too. Now that I've aged a bit, now that I'm aging a bit, that may be natural too. Although I always thought that stuff should be avoided, but Mitch such is life and, you know, to each his own. So it's, it bands sometimes, can do amazing things and bands sometimes can do stuff that you'd say, why in the hell would they even do that? And sometimes it's about attitudes. And if you want to boil it down, it's about egos and ego has no place. And they talk about it all the time. Oh, check the ego at the door, check the ego at the door. You know, that's really hard to do. I will say I was able to do it, but I worked with great producers that told me, you know, that's essential to get, performances and to get your singer to sing his best you know he's got it you can't you got to leave that stuff outside the room i think when as a band member it caught it was difficult in that i also had to be in the band so you know when you're in the band and then sometimes you have to be hard you know you could play it better than that you know that starts to go on and maybe they resent that coming from you or if it's ron they expect it and he can get away with saying even worse you know what I'm saying? So there's that dichotomy that exists. And I don't know if it's the best thing for any band member of any, of any band to be producing the band. I, I don't, you know, I look back on it and I'm, I'm endeared, embraced and still friends with, I feel very blessed to have worked with the producers and engineers that I've worked with, but especially the producers. Well, so Larry, let me let me ask you about Ron Nevison because he, of course, is like you said, one of the greatest producers. Oh, and other than working on some Survivor albums, you went and worked with him on a couple of the Heart albums. Uh, and and I'm going to throw this in because I'm a fan of Huey Lewis, but you also appear on a song called "Nothing at All" with Johnny Cola of Huey Lewis. So I was I like, do I do I love John I love he Johnny. Did your me too. Well, I, 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 listen, I, I email Johnny every so often. I, I, he's the best. And anything Huey Lewis, I'm a fan of. So, uh, Me too. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's such a great band. But but talk to me about working on those albums, on, on The Heart and on The Bad Animals, because those are these two albums that are very, how can I put this? They're sort of stylistically different of where Heart had come from, right? They're, they're very slick. They're very MTV. They're very radio friendly. Whoa. Um, yeah, I mean, we all know, you certainly know, Mitch, that the girls didn't like that. that that's right. not what they were all about. They're really cool. They're really cool chicks. And, you know, they're kind of free-spirited and hippies. And I don't think they were particularly comfortable about getting all dialed up. And, you know, I don't think that's Nancy Wilson's ways. You know what I'm saying? And she's actually a killer guitar player. Really, really good. So my experience with Ron, though, it goes back before that, Mitch. You know, he worked. I was 22 years old. I'm in, think about this. I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles and Ron had just finished dig this, the baby's head first record. That's a kick-ass record. You know, the head first. So he had just finished that. And I think he was working with Jimmy page on something. And then before that, he finished the second bad company record. So I did some research on him. I came to find that Ron also did UFO. Now I'm a guitar guy. Okay, Michael Shanker, Mick Ross, go to Jimmy Page, go down the, the, you know, so I'm ready to pick this guy's brain. You know, I, I just, before I even met Ron, I, I, I had some kind of attachment to him. Of course. Some vibe. And once I met him. He did early quit. Thin Lizzy with uh, Scott Gorm. You can't deny oh. Scott. Oh, I love, are you kidding me? You and I speak the same language. You can't deny him. He's awesome. He's awesome. You can't, that whole Thin Lizzy thing, to me, is still underrated. I don't care what anybody tells me. It's still underrated. Still, but yeah, he goes back to all that. So I was young when my relationship with Ron started. And, you know, the first record, I'll get to the hard stuff, but when it comes to Ron, you should know, you know, the first record we did with uh, the original lineup, Gary Dennis, me and Jim and Dave, you know, Ron, we ran up a tab of about $700,000 in 1979, 80. That's a lot of money on a record. So by 88, that would have been about a $2 million budget. You don't really need to spend that. But the reason why is because nobody in the band knew how to take direction, much less from somebody as good as Ron. So after a few months, they started bucking him. But I was young watching all this, and I'm watching these guys, they're session guys, and they're really great guys and players in the song. And I'm watching Ron, and I felt like I was like sitting on top of a lamp watching from down because I would see this dichotomy developing where now they're not only bucking him they're not, and disagreeing with him, they're complaining to the A&R guy about it. And I'm thinking, this is not going to have a good ending. So, you know, some people say Ron got fired. Ron quit. Ron quit. So that hurt my feelings because he was so good. And that first record, you have no idea what that record's like because what's on vinyl is you're missing intros. They were re recorded with different ideas. You're missing the Ron Nevison drum sound. This guy had just done uh, Zeppelin. He was famous for it. He said, you know, I got hired for the drum sound. Take my name off that piece of shit. When I asked him if he wanted to leave his name on, on the record, um, they muted his room mics. A lot of bad stuff went on. So I watched this kind of thing going down. And I was not part of it. I didn't like it. And it ended up bad. Seven months later, you know, Ron's gone. Okay. So the record was up in, up in Vancouver, risk getting mixed and, those guys all turned out to be amazing. You, Bruce Fairburn, God bless him, he's no longer with us, but he's a legend. And then, of course, you got Bob Rock. He was the engineer. And yeah. look at what he's done. And then Mike Frazier was the assistant, who was, was, turned out to be superb. So you got all these talented guys. Oh, but yeah. at that, yeah, but at that place in time, they were in the room with one, with, with one member from the band, and they did things that I swear you should have never been done. And to this day, I was too young. To this day, if I had to do over, that's the one thing I would stop. I think that's where youth, you know, had a hold on me, meaning I didn't really know what to do. I felt this is really not a good situation. This guy's a brilliant guy. Okay, these guys. Now, granted, you got to look at my other band members. Those guys are, they were listening to like Chase and Blood, Sweat and Tears. I'm listening to Zeppelin, UFO, Deep Purple, you know. 
they're not, they don't know that music. So I, I could, I could sense, okay, this is a different thing, but Ron knew something else besides getting great sounds. Ron knew creativity. And more than that, Ron knows good songs. And Ron knows if a song can be great and if he can make it great. And that kind of went away. So that's where that relationship started. It started bittersweet, but then there was a bond there. There was a bond. I had a bit of a relationship with Ron. You know, uh-huh. it's a little known secret that during the second record, the premonition record, it would not be surprising that after the session, Ron was doing a, a record that <laughs> The Jefferson Starship had just gotten this new singer named Mickey Thomas. He was doing a record with Jane on it. Because, you know, it was a little known secret, but I would get in my car and drive over the hill every so often and play Ron. Well, this is what we're doing. He'd say, don't work on that. You waste your time. That's pretty good. You know, he was really, really generous about it. So I always had some draw to Ron, and I think it was his abilities. All of them, his, his know-how, his vibe, his ears, um, his, his sense of, you know, rock and where to put the drums and who does what. He just had to, such a great sense of it. So that's my start with Ron. So right there, you can see there's a, there, I had a big attachment, still do, but I have a big yeah. place in my heart for him. But a huge attachment to him because I had to watch all that go down. Great guy. And of course, oh God, he's amazing. And, and, and that right first on. album, I'm telling you, Mike Klink, who went on with Guns N' Roses, Bob Rock, who went on with uh, Metallica and Motley Crue, uh, uh, Bruce Fairburn, of course. Uh, uh, incredible. I mean, I mean m- my Lord, you, you sort of threw the kitchen sink at that album. You got everything on it. It's the best of the best. I think, I think didn't Bob, did Bob, the crew, didn't Bob Rock do the Dr. Feelgood record? He did Dr. Feelgood. He did. Okay, yeah. okay, I can remember this. Dun, 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 the beginning of dun, 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 on the radio of Dr. Feelgood. I heard the bass, drums, and guitars, and I said, Who in the fuck did this? And I, I immediately went and found out it was Bob Rock. So I know these guys work. And then, of course, they went on to do stuff like the Bon Jovi guys. So they were super talented. But, you know, back in 1980, when, you know, Mike. Frazier was kind of doing this, what's, what assistants do, and, and Bob wasn't Bob Rock yet, you know, who I don't know. And Bruce Fairborn, I never got to even meet, I don't think. Um, they weren't ready for prime time. They were still learning. Ron was in the spotlight. So, you know, you're talking about not peas and carrots, you're talking night and day. This is a guy that just physical graffiti and blah, and then you got three guys that are going to become they're, they're becoming, they're still in that, that stage of, you know, learning and applying. And, you know, Ron was already there. So that record went up to Canada. I have rough mixes of that record. Whole town's talking. If I played you the rough mix of that, it would blow your head off. It's just out of this world good. Oh, I'd love to hear it. And, of course, you know, Little, little uh, Mountain it has Studio. has a totally different intro. It has a totally different intro. There's no guitar licks over the chorus with whatever that sound was. It, there, it's got an ending on it that's got this, this guitar thing on it, not just because it's guitar. The drums are huge. It just bellows with, with that Ron capturing us doing our best. It's just unbelievable. So, you know, when I got the final record, what happened? That's what I felt. So I wasn't surprised that it didn't do very good. Well, all right, so let me ask you this. Uh, a, a fan wrote in, because I said on, on Twitter and stuff that I was going to interview you, and a fan wrote in and said, ask him if there's any chance that the Fire Makes Steel demos come out. So now you're telling me that the first album had these different mixes and stuff. Oh, yeah. Is there a yeah. point where the, the Fire Makes Steel and, and these things, like, is there a box set or something where you might just say, hey, you know what? I got these great versions. Let me just share oh, them yeah. with the fans. Mitch, you, you probably got to know me already in like 15, 20 minutes. Me, I'm all over it. I'm all right. You know, I have plans. I'll tell you about them when, when I get done doing them. But with the Survivor catalog, with the stuff that I just explained to you, like that whole town talking track, I would put that cassette on a piece of vinyl or put that cassette up and let somebody stream it. I wouldn't even touch it. I would figure out a way. I'd, I'd probably call Ron and say, remix this. If you will, you know, I would ask that of him. Um, yeah, I love when I go back and listen to some of those two inch tapes um, in the original form. 
it blows my mind. And then I take another ride down the wrong street. What happened? You know, so I try not to go down the wrong street. I, I focus on in the moment and I can hear the sounds. And, you know, Ron still had kind of an English accent because he had spent 12 or 14 years in England working with all those guys. You know, Ron was a live mixer. You know, Ron mixed the who. Ron did Derek and the Dominoes. He's got a rich background. He just doesn't tell people, but he's an amazing kind of force to be around. He was for me. And um, that stuff, I would I would probably, I think him and I had a conversation maybe a couple of years ago, within the last year and a half, anyhow. I said, someday, Ron, you're going to go back and mix these hits. What do you think? He said, we well, should talk about that. So, you know, I would talk to him, obviously, because... I would want him to take his stuff and do it. I, I'm all for it. I, I'm all for this. All right, let me ask you this. Now, this one, uh, hopefully I won't anger so you. But fire makes steel, but hold on. So you're, see, we, as being prolific, now you got to remember, Jim and I work hard. You know, Jim, Jim and I write, wrote, write a lot of songs. We wrote a lot of songs. Okay, a lot of them were hits, but that's not the target. The target is to write something that enough people just like. And if they like it enough, they're going to connect with it. But you have to understand something. We wrote thousand, we wrote a ton of songs together. So um, Ron also tapped into that. As did Philip Petty, we were prolific, but there's a danger in that too. Don't be too accepting of a couple of guys that will write, you know, 10 songs in a week. How about instead of, what is the story about that? But instead of 10 good ones, one great one would be better. So but don't forget, we wrote, Jim and I are prolific together. We wrote a lot, hundreds of songs. We wrote every day of the week, and sometimes on Saturday I would go mix them. Yeah. So, you know. A lot of we songs. kind of based. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I wouldn't trade that. That's I just want to ask you riches. one quick quick question about the beginning. My understanding is you were signed by John Kalodner, right? John Kalodner, John Kalodner. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Every time I talk to somebody who's dealt with Kalodner, they would always say, oh, you know, in, in front of us, he was really nice and he was always complimentary and you're the greatest band I've ever signed. But then behind the scenes, he always seemed to say, you know, add some sugar to those tracks and, and was always doing some, something without the band knowing. That, that's my perception from all the, all the interviews I've done. What is sort of your understanding of John? Was he... A great That's bullshit. Okay. That's all bullshit. Okay. You know, John is is a is a actually a big hearted guy. Great. The, because of many reasons, but here's the one that matters most to you and me. He's the biggest fan of music I know. And a certain type of music. And but he doesn't limit himself. Don't forget John signed Genesis, John signed A C D C. You know, go look at his history. So he's involved with these amazing creative or phil collins you know you're talking about but the bond scott era you know this is like this guy has some magic to him so i think here's what the i this is what i know about john Kladner. if you feed him enough like what happened on the first record he can be a force that perhaps is not the best version of jdk that's i thought was john as you would like if the band starts complaining and all this producer that, it, and they get him on that boat, you're sunk. That's what happened on the first record. Um, if you leave him alone and you just do your job and you let the producer do his job and everybody does their best, I think he's absolutely your best ally and he's going to bust his you know what to make sure that this record gets the best shot it's going to get. Gotcha. It's balance. I think, see, Artists won't, you ought to tell you this, you're, when you're working with somebody, and, and John Collard is a great example, you know, if you're going to go complaining to them, well, you know, this guy, and if this is too loud, and that's too loud, you start putting those ideas out there in anybody's ears, and maybe they're going to start paying attention to a cymbal bell more than they should and say, that cymbal bell's a little loud. Well, maybe it is, but does anybody know that and can't get enough of your love during the guitar solo or crash cymbal actually falls over? Because I can point it out to you. And every time you'll hear the song now, you'll say, I can't believe I never heard that before. Nobody knows it. So I think if you leave John B. Kaladner, I love him. He's a great asset because he'll get on you. He'll get on you. But when he believes in you, 
He'll call somebody and he'll say, I think he's a genius. He'll go that far. That's a guy putting a lot of belief in you. So I don't, I never had that meddling part of him. I had the part where, boy, if guys don't like, if guys start complaining about producers and whining and all that, and John gets an ear of that and starts listening, it's, it's the producer. Everybody ends up not happy. And then the end product, nobody's happy. That's just the evolution of it. Right. All right. All right. So that's fair enough. Um, let me just ask you this. Uh, you've had Dave Bickler. You've had Robin McCauley and, of course, uh, Jimmy Jim- Jameson. Robin. Uh, yeah. Robin, yeah. Uh, to talk to me about sure. some of these lineup changes and bringing in new singers. Um, you know, because I remember I turned on Dancing with the Stars and I see Survivor there with Robin McCauley. And I'm like, yeah. oh, look at that. It's kind of cool. Um, He's a great singer, man. Yeah. There ain't a better. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going to tell you something else. This guy can write. This guy can hit all the notes. This guy can actually hear. I don't know if there's something fizzy on my voice. He can actually, this guy is tuned in. And this guy can sing pop songs. He's very talented. He's a killer singer and a killer writer. Yeah. I forget I did his record before he was in the band, I think in 94. Business as usual, I think it was called. Robin and I worked together for about six months. And I was blown away at his songwriting, his lyrics writing, and he was quick. His lyrics, his singing abilities, um, his enthusiasm, how much he embraced what I did. So, you know, I think Robin was terrific. I think I haven't seen him in years, but I'm telling you, he's a great singer and he's a great contributor. He's no spectator. He will not sit in the room and spectate. He's a contributor. He, he's, he acts. He's talented. And he uses his talents. Well, in fact, he he with a new band called Black Swan released an album earlier in 2020 called Shake the World. It is a fantastic album. Holy I didn't man. know that. Yeah. Well, who, 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 so, I didn't even know that. I didn't really know. Is, uh, Jeff, who plays bass? So Jeff Pilson, who's in Dawkin and yeah, Foreigner. Jeff Pilson. No, I know who Jeff is. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. Robin's been friends with him since we were doing demos on uh, on the on that business as usual record. He would say Pilson loves his background vocals. He told me to tell you, and I never really know. I met him, but I don't know Jeff Pilson. They would send me a little thing compliments. So Pilson on bass, who played drums. Who was the drummer in that on that band? You know what? I'm so, gonna I'm gonna look it up real quick here. It so is. is it, 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 is it uh, what's his name who played with this with Foreigner and then Scorps for right. uh, Kotak? Is it yours? Uh, no, no. I have the uh, the entire lineup in front of me. So it's Jeff Pills and Robin McCauley, Reb Beach of Winger White Snake. Oh, no, no, I love him. He's yeah. the nicest guy. The and uh, the drummer is Matt Starr, who came in for Mr. Big and also uh, drums with Ace Fraley. It's a, He's a great drummer. It is a great album. It really is one of the better albums of 2020. So if you haven't heard it, take take five minutes and just go check it out. It's 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 good. It's real good. Oh, I bet it. Listen, you put the. I know that I can, I know enough about the people in that combination to say you know I gotta hear that because it's great. You know, I do. Oh, oh yeah. So we, we so it are... was Robin, it was Jeff Tilson, uh, the Red drummer Beach. I don't know. Matt Starr but and Red, Red Beach. Beach. Yeah. Red <sighs> Beach is just, he's, he's such a, forget his unbelievable guitar playing. And okay, if people want to go fast, he'll go faster than everybody else. But you know, Jeff Beck's my idol, so there's night and day, but he's one of the nicest people I think I've ever met is Red Beach. So I could see that being something I would go listen to. When we're done, I'm surprised I hadn't heard about it. Oh yeah, and uh, just real quick, by the way, I, I want to because we're almost at an hour, so I just want to tell the fans real quick: if you follow Frankie Sullivan official on Instagram, you post some of the greatest pictures of these classic guitars that <laughs> would make most collectors mouth water. Uh, that, that's just a, it's, it's a fun follow. I have to say, it really, is just fun to follow and see those classic guitars. In fact, here, let me. Uh, I'm gonna look at it right now. Which which ones do we have today? Uh, I don't know. If, did I put any up today? I don't know if I had. I put a, a couple of nice ones yesterday. Yesterday or whatever you put the uh, 1956 ES350 TN. Yeah, that's 
They made six of those. That's one of my favorite. That's a guitar clap and not B one, but he played that type of guitar in the Hail Hail Rock and Roll movie. That's so rare he took it home with him. So there's one. So I have the other one. So there's four more they ever made. Wow. Who knows if they're in working condition. Or yeah, they might have been destroyed or burnt in a fire or who knows. Um all right, since since we've gone along, I will finish with this. Uh, back to this uh, to this fan, Lance Rushing, who wrote, he says, can you please ask Frankie if he is ever going to have an autobiography come out? I, I tell you what I'm taken aback by. Mitch, if you knew how many people said that to me, you would be astounded. It kind no. of blows my mind. Everybody always, either fans or friends or or even Instagram or, you know, or Stallone, um, or, or his, their cousin. You know, I think somebody says, you you have to write a book. Because <laughs> I, I have this photographic memory. You know, I don't, I don't have a memory that's based in me. I think my memory is based in, like, reality. And I do. I, re- I have a photographic memory. I can remember everything. Probably back to the age of seven. So I, everybody, when I talk to them, I don't know how you go about doing that. To be honest with you, well, there, there, there's different ways. I mean, I, I have a friend, Greg Renoff, who does these Van Halen books, and he just did a Ted Templeman book, and he interviewed what a great Ted. Producer. Oh, one of the best. I uh, love Ted. Well, and, the best. and this book that that Greg put out, it's it's almost 500 pages, but essentially he just interviewed Ted for hours upon hours, you know, 10, 20, 30 hours, and then called all those stories into a book. So maybe that's the way you do it. You find a a writer, and you tell him the stories and let him do the heavy yeah, lifting. Yeah, he's a good writer. He's a good guy. He's a good one. I know that name that you mentioned. You know, that my, if I have a problem, and I have many in that area, if I have a problem, it's like, where do, you know, the reach out. Like, where do you reach out? And, you know, I think you, we age gracefully and it's beautiful, but I think you start forgetting about who do you reach out, who do you reach out. I'm as ambitious as hell, but I'll tell you what, I would love I would love to do it. I would love to do it. I'd love right. to do it. I'll be more than I'd happy to, to connect you. From, I'd have to get a permission from a couple of ladies and stuff, but they probably I'm sure they would give it to me, but I would love to do it. I would love to do it. Oh, well, hey, There's if you so have... much of this history that I have to share and you know, I'm connected with so many people. You know, it's no secret. You know, Sly's brother is one of my best friends. Okay, so they're Italian people. Well, that means, you know, and the cousin, my realtor, there's, this isn't just a song that happened. In the, there's a whole side of this that people have no clue about. This is, a, this is an evolution over time that makes sense. Now we're all older. You know, do you ever follow Sly on Instagram? He's great. You know, now those guys in Arnold, they're older. But, you know, for me, there's been a development that's from that whole Eye of the Tiger thing. That it's just missed not just about the songs. I'm friends with people now. And, you know, his brother, I, I'm endeared to, we are like brothers. I love and Frank. Then, so Frank's great. He's great. You know, That's about 20 years friend. ago, uh, friend, right? somewhere around the 2000s, Frank started uh, calling me because he had an album or something coming out. And for a little period there, for a few months, we would talk on the phone like once a week. And, and I, I kind of missed that, actually. I wish I, could, I wish I could reach back out. But anyway, um, I will finish. I'm sure on, you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish on this. Yeah. This is, this is the, one of the greatest moments of, uh, what do you want to call it, Americana or, or uh, pop culture. But Yeah, that's cool. That's pop, good enough. But, but you did this Starbucks Eye of the Glen. I call it the Eye of the Glen um, Starbucks so commercial. So do I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is such a funny commercial. It is so great. I put it up on my Twitter this afternoon for folks who may have forgotten about it. But any any interesting story about putting that together and actually rewriting the entire song so that it's not Eye of the Tiger, but really Eye of the Glen? You know, it was... It was a, I can tell you the week was kind of an odd week because that week I did, I did something for Joe Azuzu too. So it was a, it was kind of like, this is super cool. And then, you know, when Starbucks comes here and then you end up with a lifetime Starbucks card, that's kind of fun. Cause when you go to the Starbucks counter, I drink bulletproof coffee, you know, he needs it. But when I go to the Starbucks counter, when I traveled, um, I hit in my card, it always, it always raises an eyebrow, but it was such a fun idea and they're such a great company and 
one of my my attorney who actually disbanded always loved um he went on to run starbucks bucks record label but in the interim he kind of put that together they reached out to us and so i kind of rewrote the lyrics and i had still our engineer come out to california and we cut it and Everybody was having a really good time. We knew it was going to be fun. And, you know, okay, is this just another kind of commercial where I don't want them to use Tiger? Or I'm going to use it if we can kind of manage it. And I always looked at that song like, this is important to Sly, man. I don't want this on a, no offense, a Doritos commercial. You know, they're good, but I don't want, you know, I never wanted to see that. So I was kind of real, listen, our John Merrick, I'm going to tell you, I, I was very picky about that song, who used it. I think the Starbucks thing was just meant to be, and it was so much fun. By the time we got done with it, it took only about a day or two. They said, we want to make a TV commercial. We need a band. Do you guys want to do it? I thought it was great because it was like slapstick almost. You know, we're pushing the stage and the drums down the street. It was great fun. It was great fun. They were great to do it for. I think we all did it. The band, the Starbucks people, they were serious as hell. We were having a blast, but I think at a certain level, we all did it because it was fun. It was different for them, and it was different for us, but I think that difference made it a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. you know, like the shower scene, like somebody shaving, and some <laughs> were standing close in the shower. In one bathroom, you got the whole band, a couple of cameramen. I can remember thinking, I don't know, does it get, is there, can there be more fun than this at this moment? You know, stuff like that is really cool. That stuff is really, really cool. So that's how that evolved. They just we finished it, the lyrics and the and the you know, Jay Jane was saying it and then they said, Well, we need a band. We came up with this concept. Would you guys you know, we'll do it. Sure. It was great fun. They just were they're they're they they are a super company to work with. They were super creative and they just it was fun. It won some couple awards, you know, I don't really pay attention to, but it was fun, a lot of fun. And I think people which pick up on fun, good times. Well, well I you certainly know? do. And I, and I think, I think if you look at your music, it's very fun. You, you look at the singles, it's very fun. And you look at this commercial and it's very fun. And uh, this interview, by the way, has been fun. Now, we're at an hour, so... I will I will say merci merci monsieur as we say here in Montreal and uh, maybe at some point we can do a part 2 that'd be great. You need to do like a tent you with me you need to do like a whole series because you just got like the tip of the iceberg you know I always felt like everybody tells me you got all that survivor history so I have it all in my head and I can remember all of it every detail every place Every person, what we did, it's, 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 it's kind of incredible. And I have to tell you something. I don't have a lot of bad memories. I have a few sad memories. Sad. That's a different word. I don't really have a lot of bad memories like you think bad members do or, you know. I never really copped that attitude. Well, so we I, could talk about that next time. I would love know? to hear them. Uh, you, you toured with one of my favorite artists, Brian Adams, back in the uh, early 80s. You had Mickey Curry, who's one of the world's greatest drummers oh in the my band God, for a you're, year. You're, okay, so wait, this is up here. I was just, there's a, there's, a, there's a famous guitar player that follows me that shows his guitars off. That, and his check, I kind of asked him for favors once in a while. He was recording something and he just said, it said under the post, drums courtesy of Mickey Curry. And I was just about, this was this morning, to click on that and say, okay, I got to find them and follow them. But first I got to call them because I wanted to play drums on a couple of songs of mine. And yeah, that was a, a great, great tour to be on. You know, we were swapping number one records, Heaven and Search is Over. And um, there's a lot of teasing going on. You know, Keith, Keith Scott's an amazing guitar player. Um, we were both playing Fender Stratocasters, which in the 80s were not that bold, but we were going after different stuff, different things, you know, electric 12 strings. And um, and as different as we were, I think Brian was a lot different. Brian Adams liked his um, Hanes undershirts and his denim jeans. And I can remember Rolling Stone followed him for a week and I was laughing. He said, look, at, they're taking pictures of his combat boots. That's all he wore on stage. You remember everybody would dress up in the 80s with Brian Adams had his Hanes t-shirts, the Levi jeans, and a couple pair of combat boots. And he says, look at it. I said, you're going to be in the cover of Rolling Stone, your, your boots and your jeans, because 
you know, the only other guy that does is a Springsteen. And as time went on, you know, Brian became his biggest Springsteen across the ponds, many places in the world. He's just iconic. But those are, I remember all that stuff. That was a great fun tour. I hitched a ride with those guys on the plane. I was famous for that. Kevin Cronin, too, because his folks lived in Oak Lawn, which is close to my parents. And when we would tour at Ario, he would say, hey, uh, yeah, I'll take it. I'll hitch a ride. <laughs> Have your bags in the hallway at noon, you know. Um, blah, 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 pick them up. So I've been known to dip you guys out, ride with the other bands and hang and have a good time. I, I'm, I'm really endeared to my history and my career. And I, if I have any problem, I can't get over um, how much I love music. I mean, not hopey. I mean, listening to it, you know, I'm into this hi-fi world now, so. And don't even go there because the stuff gets ghastly pricey. And I only want to use tube stuff. So it's only audio research. And I am only, I, I scream a lot in high depth, but you put on a vinyl record, it just kills you. So I just love listening to music, playing music. I love the touring. I love the other players. You know, I had a lot of good times. I have a lot of memories of that stuff. And, and you're going to have to go listen to that Black Swan record by, by the end of the day. I already wrote that. It's written down on a yellow memo right here, stuck on the table. Oh, yeah. See? And, and and we'll have to hear some Mickey Curry stories at some point. He he is just one of the nicest guys in rock, and he can play drums like like nobody else. He's just fantastic. Okay, so here's the guy, Phil Petty, going, okay, so they, they're going to use a different bass player and drummer. Okay, well, I'll fix him up. He puts, he gets in there and he figures it out. Okay, so it's supposed to be all about this guy, but it's really about that guy. And then he puts me, he sets all my marshals up in the room, and then he puts me standing up right next to a guy that I really just, hi, how you doing? And, you know, and start, hey, Mickey Curry, standing right next to him. If you heard some of these one-inch tapes, jams of like where songs like She's the Star came out of, you know, when I come up with those riffs, Philip Petty ran one inch tapes all the time. I have some unbelievable jams with Mickey Curry and I, and I think Philip Petty put me next to him. In fact, now that I'm, I, I not that I know by design because he probably figured I'm going to get some guitar drum stuff. I like burning bridges, you know, that, that's stuff that he was doing. You know, she's a star that, <laughs> you know, at the beginning he was slamming to and for this one day went, nah, 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 nah. I said, keep going. You know, he was standing next to that guy. It's like standing next to Thunder. You know, I miss him. Fun person, killer drummer, but the guy that put me next to him, think about it. I'm going, why am I standing out here? I don't really know the guy. I was a little bit uncomfortable because he was a stranger. But then I thought, as later on in life, as I listened to these one-inch tapes, and they ran for hours. So you're talking about a whole project where we're cutting tracks. And I find some of these jams and I hear him playing at the beginning of She's a Star, and I start doing a lick, and he'll stop, and I'm like, no, keep playing it. He was just such a slamming, um, thunderous force to stand next to, um, creatively with a guitar on my hands. Also, yeah, he's a terrific guy. He's really easy, easy to work with. He's super good. Everybody knows that, and he's super fun, but boy, can he play. Standing next to him was, I always told Phil Petty, you did that by, on purpose. No, he never really copped it, but I said, you did that by design, but it sure kicked me in the ASS. I loved it. Oh, yeah. Anyway, great, great memories, and uh, we, uh, we, are, we are at a minute, an hour five, so uh, merci, monsieur. Oh, we, we will do I this. could go forever. We so could. Did you get enough of what you needed? Yeah, I got everything have. I needed, and I've also... Uh, I've also got a million new questions, but uh, we we will give it a we'll give it a rest there today for two reasons. First yeah, of all, and... first of all, when I do the interviews, I have to turn off the air conditioning, and I am <laughs> slowly melting in here. And uh, I also have an, an interview in about fifteen minutes, so I gotta I gotta move mm -hmm. along. But th th fine. this has we'll been a pleasure, absolute oh, pleasure. It's been a great pleasure, and and thank you for the follow on Twitter. It really put a sparkle in my eye. I I, I looked at it and I'm I went, glad I and I went that. Frankie Sullivan. I went, I went, I went, I went the the Frankie Sullivan, like him. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, you know, because Instagram started out as fun, and then you know the social media companies. Well, you can just post there, and it'll show up everywhere else. Okay, so then I started paying attention, but you know, making one connection like this and i think it's worth you know all the time that you 
put into it because social media, we could talk about it later. That's a whole other beast, isn't it? That's why I like guitars and Instagram. You know, look at the guitar players. We all follow each other. <laughs> and you're all fun. crazy collectors. I mean, We're crazy people. S- speaking of, of collectors, I, you know, I, I speak to Brad Gillis and Johnny Cola, and and as soon as you say there's a guitar for sale somewhere, they're like, really, really, where, 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 yeah, where can I buy it? it? And and it's just I went funny. This morning, I went to okay, so we we'll with this. I went this morning and picked up a '65 Telecaster that I had my eyes on for about six months. I just picked it up today. Wow, there's a, funny. Lot, there's a lot of listeners that are guitar fans that are very jealous of you right now for having said that. No, you know what? I'm just kind of the, I'm going to steal a line from Joe Bonamassa because he puts it right. I'm just the proprietor of them. They're really not mine. They have a life of their own. They'll end up with somebody else. So I think when you look at them, you got to look at an instrument and say, where did it come from? You know, these are old guitars, 56 years old. So where'd they come from? Who played them? You know, look at this vibe on this. It said, like, one of mine has mold that worked its way. It's one of my favorite Stratocasters. I'm like, where did, I wonder who played it all. So guitars have a life in them. I just feel like I'm a proprietor. That's what Bonham always says is an introduction. I think that's the right way to put it. For now, because they'll end up with some other player. Hopefully, hopefully that's where they'll go. Now, now at the beginning of the interview, you said that somebody said you should follow me Joe Bon of Massa does follow me, and he's he's a great guy. Was it him that said, "Hey, maybe you should follow Mitch"? I think it might have been. He follows me, you know that. Yeah, he and, and, and yeah, Joe he is me. he is awesome. I love Joe. He's such a great guy. He's, he's great. He's great. Yes, and he's got a quirky sense of humor you kind of don't expect it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know he's he, he's, he's great. He he's a he's a real down to earth guy, and. You know, the way he looks and the way he dresses and then the jokes he makes and then the way he plays his guitar, it, like, in a sense, it's all like... Match. It doesn't <laughs> match. It doesn't match. It's an image clash, and yet it's the greatest thing ever. Anyway, on that... It's called, yeah. You know what? Tell Rick Nielsen, he's not... There's another cheap trick around, too, you know. I always used to tease Rick about that. What's the, he says, well, you know the name of the band because they're one, they're one of my favorite bands like everyone else. I love Trick. And I used to make, they'd say, well, remember the name of the band. You know, that's how I feel about Joe, because he's so, it doesn't fit, you know, what you see, you're right, with the jokes and his playing, and it doesn't really fit, but maybe that's the magic. In it. But he's he's awesome. You know? Anyway, thank you, sir. I've got to get running to this other interview. I'm, we're talking about okay. the, uh, Robbie Robertson and the band in my next interview, so i got to go get ready for that. You should be, there. you know, that's all I've been listening to. Yeah, you know that's funny. You get so you call me back on the side. I'll tell you something about that. Sounds that's something good. Something else I'm working on. Okay, thank you. Well, sir. nice to talk to you. You too. Bonsoir. Cheers. Bonsoir. Bye. 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 This has been Rock Talk with Mitch Lafon. For more exclusive content and interviews, subscribe on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, and many more. Follow Mitch on all the socials, especially Twitter at Mitch Lafon, and on Instagram at Mitch underscore Lafon. Get your Mitch merch now at loudtracks.com slash Mitch.